Good evening from London and welcome to everyone again uh, for our second session of this three-part mini-series. Um, good afternoon, good morning to the rest of the world. Um, as ever, I love watching the chat come through. We've got Tunisia, Canada, India, Italy, Nigeria, Japan, Croatia, Latvia, Dubai, Belgium, London, Croatia, Argentina, to name just a few. So, as I said yesterday, for those that were with us and this superb discussion that we had with Francesco Della Villa about ACL injuries, um, this marks the weekend of the original dates of our conference. Um, those dates have been moved to April next year, and we look forward to welcoming you in Lyon. But it felt like we needed to bring together the football medicine, football science community. And it's a great privilege to sit here and just share the energy, understand that the breadth of our community is as strong, as wide, and as diverse as ever. And it's just a moment for us all to be together. So what I want to do today is introduce Matthew Buckthorpe. Matthew is part of our education and research department. Um, he wrote a blockbusting um, paper on injury prevention of hamstring injuries in elite football a couple of years ago. And some of those themes will come through in the conversation today. We'll have about half an hour with him speaking and then we'll run a couple of polls. And then after that, we'll have a question and answer. So if you have questions, please feel free to type those into the Q&A box not the chat box, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And um, we look forward to engaging with you over this next hour. Matthew. Thanks, Mike. Hello, everybody. It's um, yeah, a pleasure to, to be with you all. Uh, it's fantastic to look down, as Mike said, and see so many people from so many different countries. I think I'll need to use my isokinetic accent tonight to make sure I don't speak too quickly. Um, and, and yeah, we've got a pretty exciting topic ahead. Um, so hamstring injuries are, just share my screen. So yeah, hamstring injuries are a very relevant, very hot topic within sports medicine. They are a passion of mine since probably for the last sort of 10, 12 years since I started working within within football. And as Mike said, we're going to share a, uh, a pretty, pretty popular paper that was published in British Journal of Sports Medicine, which I wrote, but I wrote in collaboration with, with the, the guys of Southampton Football Club, which I'll get into in a sec, and also with, with some colleagues at Isokinetic Medical Group as well. And so just going to do a quick bio of, of some of my background. So I'm from a sport and exercise science background. I, I studied at Loughborough University, um, did a PhD in neuromuscular performance. So I'm going to speak a lot on strength today. And, and I like to go quite in depth on, on strength. And, and sometimes I, I do like to, to, to go quite detailed in that area. And that's my expertise. And I think that knowledge really helped me as a sports rehab specialist with isokinetic where I, I joined um, I joined Mike and the rest of the team in London around eight years ago. I then started to work with Southampton Football Club with Mo Gimple at, um, in their performance support department and that was around sort of four years ago and that's really where this project sort of took took shape. I then started working more with the education and research department at Isokinetic and, and now I'm a, a lecturer and, and sports um, consultant also in, in sports rehab. And so the hamstring project is what I largely want to want to talk about. It's, oops, sorry, it's um, made up of three parts really. The editorial was uh, the first kind of small sort of paper that we we really threw out there just to see if there was any interest in it and and I, I wrote this with with um the guys at Southampton and, and Matthew Stride and it was 
yeah, quite quite relevant, quite um, quite popular. So that really gave us the the legs to to do the main paper, which I wrote a couple of years ago, and published with the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And this time had a, a bigger team involved with me. So some colleagues from Isokinetic, so Michael Davison, um, Stefano Della Villa, uh, Jenny Nanny, and then quite a few individuals from Southampton as well, and all within their areas of expertise. So Laurel Bowen within the GPS, and for example, uh, Bill Stiles on a strength measure. So what I'm gonna share today is, is very much a, a team-based approach. Um, lots of individuals from lots of different areas of expertise all working and contributing together. Some of them researchers, some of them just practitioners. I don't mean just practitioners, but high level practitioners um, who focus more on research implementation rather than production. And then recently we've just shared an infographic also, um, which was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine last week. So um, I, I largely want to focus on, on strength training um, after a, um, strength training within the, the hamstring. Um, but I'm going to give a quick overview of the, the landscape of football hamstrings first. I'm going to try to go quite quickly through this um, with the view of getting towards the, the applied practical aspects as quickly as possible. So injuries in football are generally problematic. There's, there's three main areas, one being the, the financial impact. So we know that the that, that injuries within the Premier League cost a lot of money. Then we also have the team performance impact. So players getting injured has a negative impact on team performance. And then we have the player performance impact. And we know um, that lots of players who have sustained injuries have never quite been the same after. So injuries are, are problematic. Muscle injuries in particular are um, very common in football. So they account for around a third of all injuries. And within that, hamstring injuries are the most prevalent. So hamstring injuries account for 12% of all injuries, and they are the most common muscle injury. They can be frustrating injuries. Um, they can have prolonged ongoing symptoms, poor healing, and, and a high risk of re-injury. Perhaps the most relevant aspect of hamstring injuries is, although we are learning more and more each year, their rate in football keeps going up and up. So, so around a 4% increase year on year was shown in an excellent paper by Jan Ekstrand and their group, and hamstring injuries keep going up and up. So I'm just going to give a, a brief overview of, of how hamstring injuries happen. Firstly, there are two types of hamstring injury. And so Carl Asklin proposed the sprinter type, largely implicating the biceps femoris, and also the stretch type, mostly impacting the semimembranosis. In football, hamstring injuries are mostly due to high-speed running mostly affecting the biceps femoris. So they are a particularly important injury for us to, to be aware of. But the stretch type can also be quite severe. It can have prolonged healing, poor recovery times, and they can be susceptible to re-injury because they normally involve the free proximal tendon. It's important that injuries also happen in other ways. So they sometimes happen during change of direction or rapid deceleration with a, with a trunk lean as well. In terms of hamstring running injuries, these are the most, um, most important within football and we need to have a very good understanding of these. And it's thought that both the swing and stance phase of sprinting, where the hamstrings are put under a lot of tension, whilst eccentrically lengthening to decelerate knee extension have been suggested as the, the main scenario when hamstring injuries occur. And this has really laid the foundation for our current prevention methods, which largely focuses on eccentric strength training of the hamstring muscles. And perhaps the most relevant question um, for today is, is why are hamstring injuries on the rise? So we're learning more and more about them and we are producing lots of research and we're sharing um, lots of information at conferences and journals, but they keep going up and up. So really the, the question why they're going up is really important. 
And a very important paper that came out from Roald Barr uh, demonstrated that teams are not using evidence-based, um, sorry, they're not following evidence-based uh, methods in that the Nordic hamstring curl shown in the picture when used as part of a program has been shown to reduce injuries in football by more than two thirds. So using a Nordic hamstring exercise program, a reduction of nearly 70% of injuries within these randomized control trials um, prospectively led. And Rollbar showed that in a survey that only 11% of teams fully adopt the Nordic hamstring exercise program. So there is this program that works, vast amount of evidence, but teams are not using the full program. Now, from the paper and from certain conferences, they would say that this is the teams not using evidence appropriately. And that could be one reason, but there are also some other reasons that we felt the need as, um, as a team at Southampton to, to share in that we feel they're a little bit more complex and that just using the Nordic hamstring exercise program is not enough in our opinion. So running at high speeds poses a huge demand on the hamstring muscles and the amount of high speed running and high and sprint distance in football has increased dramatically over the course of a seven year period up until 2013 was around a 30 to 35% increase in high-speed running and sprint distance. So football is getting more intense. Players' total distances are staying quite similar, but they're doing more high-intensity actions. Sprinting is the mechanism of injury, places huge demand on the hamstrings, hence higher amounts of running. Maybe this explains the increase in hamstring injuries. Now, I briefly alluded to it a second ago that we don't believe that hamstring injuries are as simple as using a singular mode strategy such as the Nordic hamstring curl. We believe that a holistic approach is, is needed and there's starting to become a body of evidence suggesting this. So some of my work, um, um, the, the editorial and the, the hamstring um, paper in BGSM and what this is based on, as well as a, um, a nice editorial from Jürgen Mendy Guccia, who is one of the key individuals in the area. A fantastic paper from Peter Bruckner when, they were at, when he was at Liverpool on recurrent hamstring injuries, applying um, the limited evidence using a seven step program rather than just, just Nordics. And then um, Jürgen doing some, some work on um, hamstring injury treatment, but there is currently no evidence within um, injury prevention of primary injuries. And there's an excellent paper from, from Bittencourt suggesting that injuries are not so simple. Singular strategies do not explain why injuries happen. Instead, there is this complex web of determinants with multiple risk factors all working together to explain why injuries happen. So if hamstring injuries are quite complex, influenced by lots of factors, then a singular based strategy is unlikely to work in our opinion but the current recommendations are to use a singular based strategy focused on eccentric training. So let's wait and see what the evidence will tell us. Now, there's a fantastic project underway um, from um, JB Moran's group um, involving Johan Lati. And, and this looks a fantastic paper looking to see whether or not what we said in our paper is in fact true. So does a multifactorial individualized program reduce the risk of injury. Now, currently there's no evidence apart from anecdotal experience and, and of course our papers sharing um, very much level five based evidence. So what I'm gonna go on to now is really recommendations for hamstring injury prevention. So what are my recommendations and those of the, the colleagues that, that I work with on these papers? And what would we suggest that you need to do to prevent hamstring injuries within elite level footballers? So firstly, I think it's really important that you, you consider the, um, the factors uh, to the, within this slide, so the considerations in designing an injury prevention program. There's a lot of contextual factors that are really, really important. It's not as simple as just having the best program. 
there are various um, factors that need to be considered. And the, the first of these is to do your risk factor analysis and planning. So what we need to do is to look at all the possible risk factors and understand how they may be linked. And, and for this, what you should do initially is to, to consider the available evidence. So the prospective risk factors that are available, recognizing that for a singular risk factor to play a strong role in injuries, then it has to be very strong. Hence, sometimes it's hard to find consistent singular risk factors in prospective um, studies. So, but you also need to think about the theory, consider anecdotal experience. And then in the end, what we found was these are the things we think are in some way linked to hamstring injuries. And it looks pretty complex. However, we don't believe that all risk factors are created equally. And within the paper, we suggest um, that you should consider both specific and general risk factors, and then some semi-important risk factors, and then these risk factors that are recognized, but maybe don't inform your normal practice. And, and I was I sat down with, with Mo Gimple, Steve Wright, um, to, to go through this. And what we, we said was, this is a similar way of working. What we did was we took all the risk factors, we thought, what are the most relevant? What are the most important? and we focus on those. And we consider the other things, we have it in the back of our mind, but it doesn't inform our normal practice unless we have a, an athlete who has many injuries, so lots of recurrent injuries. And what we, um, what we saw was we think there's a series of specific risk factors that we need to consider, but when you're trying to prevent injuries, you can't just think about specific risk factors. It's not just a previous hamstring injury. It's not just eccentric hamstring strength. You also need to think about the risk factors that increase the susceptibility to any injury. Because if your general injury risk goes up, then of course your risk of getting a hamstring is also gonna go up. So there are a host of other, other factors, these general risk factors that need to also be considered. And then anyone that's, that's been involved in, in a football team um, and tried to do these programs in an applied setting will know you've gotta get key stakeholder buy-in and that's in any organization you work with elite sport or, or even private practice key decisions and, and and practices are dependent on getting buy-in from your key decision makers coaches that influence injury risk uh, so there's um some great work that's been done from a yanax trans group um, a nice paper on communication styles also involving michael davison and we know that coaches, it's an influence on injury risk. So we need to get their buy-in. We need to get them to, 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 to implement the strategies that we want. And to do that, you have to educate people. You have to know how they like to receive information and you have to tailor your messaging to that individual. You're not gonna sit down with a manager, you know, and hand them, hand them my paper or hand them the work from, from sorry, the work from Peter Bruckner or, or, or else. You, you're going to try and tailor your message into that individual. The same with the players, with the coach, with your staff. So it's really important to educate people in the right way, get their buy-in. Otherwise, you, you can have the best program, but no one's going to do it. Now, this is a bit more controversial, but, but we believe that you need to target interventions at the individual player's profile. So if a particular profile explains why people get injured, you should tailor your interventions to that program. Um, to that profile. And I think this is really important. When we get to the, the five-step program that I'm going to recommend, it's recognizing that you don't do the same program for everybody. You think about their, their, um, their particular profile and you try to modify it according to, to what they show you. Players are screened as part of their health evaluations. Um, and, and so you can get key information from the players at the start of season as part of regular monitoring. And then you can understand where their deficits are. And what you should do is then tailor that intervention according to that profile that you are shown. And lastly, it's important to recognize that hamstring injuries represent only 12% of all injuries. So the other 88% need to be considered. And I think this is sometimes lost um, within certain research groups where there's such a huge focus on only addressing a particular injury. So people are recommending, you know, ACL prevention programs or recommending hamstring prevention programs. Whatever you recommend has to be part of a general program addressing a, an athlete's injury risk for all injuries. There's no point implementing a, 
a, an, a, a hamstring based approach, reducing the hamstring injuries, if then the, the hip and groin injuries go up or the Achilles tendon injuries go up or you have more ACLs. You need to reduce the total injury burden. And to do that, you have to have a program that addresses all of the injuries with hamstring been the most common. So what we recommend within the papers is to use a five point plan. And so those strategies are to strengthen the hamstring muscles, to monitor player load and recovery, to prescribe lumbar pelvic control exercises, to incorporate a focus on movement quality, and to develop players' physical conditioning. And I'm not going to have time to go through all of these, but I'm going to focus a lot more on the strengthening the hamstring muscles, which I think is the most relevant. It's the most specific to hamstrings. And, and what I believe is a lot of the other factors are, are very much playing a role in our general risk factors. So these are increasing our susceptibility for a host of injuries. Now, some of the criticism that, that we get with hamstring prevention programs is that, that certain authors, certain researchers will say, well, there's very little evidence that, that core stability training, however you want to define it, is, plays a role in hamstring injuries. Um, anecdotally, I believe it does. The people I've worked with believe it does. Um, yes, there isn't very strong evidence available yet, but there is some very good theory, some anecdotal evidences. Um, but just because it might not be strongly linked with hamstrings doesn't mean it shouldn't be part of your program. So lumbar pelvic control exercises, it's been associated with things like hip and groin injuries, it's been associated with ankle sprains, ACL injuries. It's a key part of a general prevention program, and it is also linked with hamstring injuries as well. Managing player load is, is very important as a general risk factor. And um, there are particular specifics that are linked to hamstring injuries. So when we're thinking about the GPS readings and the player loadings that we're getting in during the match, some of those variables are linked to hamstring injuries. Some of those variables will be linked to, to adductor strains. Some variables will be linked to chronic overuse injuries. And so it's important to recognize it's a general risk factor. Um, but there are certain specifics for the hamstring. Incorporating a focus on movement quality, I believe is a key part of prevention of all injuries, most injuries, um, particularly things like patellofemoral pain, ACL injuries, um, and also the hamstring. Yes, we don't have evidence yet, but I do believe we will in the future. Now, the fact that we don't have evidence available yet doesn't mean in my opinion that I should then not focus on it and I should sit back and wait for the researchers to tell me the appropriate time to use this. I think that there is a, a good role of movement quality in, in, in hamstring injuries. And there are some small studies giving me a little bit of um, information that that might be the case. But what I wanna focus on here is, is there are lots of factors that, that increase your general injury risk. Your, your approach should address that but you also need to think about the specifics for the hamstring to make sure that they are included and focused if your goal is to really reduce your hamstring injuries. Okay, so I'm gonna focus quite heavily now on exercise selection for strengthening the hamstring muscles. And the main reason for this is I think it's the most interesting, I think it's the most relevant, I think it's the most specific to, to, um, to hamstrings. And I also, from feedback and questions prior to the, to the session, it seemed to be the area that people want to have the most information on. And so firstly, you know, why is strength important? So theoretically, injuries to the muscle tendon junction occur when excess forces internally happen beyond the mechanical limits of the muscle. And they cause um, stress strain and, 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 of course, damage to the muscle. So by increasing the, the limit for, for force tolerance, this should theoretically reduce your injury risk because you now have a higher um, tolerance load. So you increase the, the threshold. Technically, these muscle actions should no longer result in injury. There's good evidence for the role of strength training on injury risk, the hamstring. So use of eccentric hamstring strength training, the most widely researched method, um, has been shown to reduce primary and secondary hamstring injuries by 65 to 85%. And there are a couple more recent papers also. This is mostly focused on the Nordic hamstring exercise program, which is, seems to be the modality that is most commonly researched. 
However, I want to first have a bit of a look at what strength is. Now, I, I think that, that part of our program and part of, part of the research really doesn't address, in my opinion, the complexity of strength. I think it ignores strength and it simplifies it to um, simplifies it too much. And I think strength is should be defined as the ability of the neuromuscular system to produce force. That's a very common definition used. Um, I then expanded this definition in the editorial and stress that it's influenced by biomechanical, neural and morphological factors. And the contributions of these are dependent on this, the task. So they are influenced by the context. Your ability to produce force in an isolated situation is different to produce force in a functional situation or during sprint running. And what we do as researchers, and I, was, I did this during my PhD, was in order to assess strength, I simplified the task to the most simplest way I could because I wanted to detail the, the role of, of, of neural and morphological factors on its expression. So I made the task really simple. And, and that's generally what happens in a lot of research. In order to examine strength, it's much harder to assess strength in, in, in sprint running or in a different task, so we simplify the task. It's important to recognize the difference between functional and isolated strength. Functional strength is the ability to produce force in situations in which it's commonly used and injured, i.e. something like sprint running. Isolated tasks minimize the requirements for neural control. And they're really about developing the muscle's capacity to produce force, which can be produced under a particular situation. They don't mimic the way the muscle works. Most sporting actions such as sprinting require high levels of motor control. And there are a lot of biomechanical and neural differences between these isolated tasks like a Nordic hamstring curl and the, the functional strength expression um, within, within sprint running. And really your ability to produce force in a Nordic hamstring curl is very much your capacity to produce force. Um, actually how you express that in a functional situation is very dependent on your intermuscular coordination and your skill. If you have poor coordination, you won't be able to express the strength in a functional manner. Now, we, we also need to think that we've got different types of strength. So maximal strength is your ability to produce your maximal force, but this typically takes time to produce. Most sporting movements like sprint running happen with ground contact times around 100 to 125 milliseconds. So that is typically around 60, 70% of maximal force production when measured isometrically. So it takes time to produce your force. So if you've got poor rate of force development, you can't express your maximal strength in an explosive situation. We also need to think about power and high velocity strength. So power is very important to, for performance and athletic tasks. It's influenced by lots of factors. Slow velocity strength is only one of those. We also have high velocity strength, skill, coordination, rate of force development, stretch shortening cycle. And importantly, during sprinting, the muscle and the joints work at high speeds. So the hip is flexing at very, very high, um, high angular velocity, 700 degrees per second. And, and, during, and the knee will extend at nearly 1,000 degrees per second. And these are much, much higher speeds than, than we're training for. So I'm going to really give you three main focus points on, on how, what I think you should do in terms of strengthening the hamstring for preventing hamstring strains. The first one is to focus on eccentrics. So, sorry, there's quite a lot of theory and science involved now. Um, I want to try to give you the evidence, but I'm just going to talk around the slides. But firstly, eccentric strength is the most important. So hamstring injuries happen during eccentric contractions, which we think there's a tiny bit of a debate, but it's largely during eccentric mechanisms. Higher levels of eccentric strength, but not concentric strength, have been shown to be protective um, in prospective studies. So having higher eccentric strength is important to prevent injuries, not concentric strength. Adaptations are normally mode specific. So if you do concentric strength training, you will improve more your concentric strength, eccentric strength training, more your eccentric strength. And use of eccentric hamstring Strength training, i.e. the Nordic hamstring, has been shown to be very good at preventing injuries. So there's good evidence there that eccentrics work. 
Now, eccentric training overloads the muscle to a greater extent, improves muscle mass, strength, and power more than concentric training. There's a dose response relationship between training intensity and gains in strength. Now, eccentrics involve higher intensity contractions. They generally result in higher gains in strength and you can increase your eccentric strength quite rapidly using eccentric strength training, nearly 20% over a relatively short period of time. Now, one area that doesn't always get appreciated, and there's some excellent research coming out from the, from the Australians um, in this area, but um, is the role of the fasc muscle fascicle length. So particularly biceps femoris, um, long head fascicle length has been, if you have short muscle fascicles, you've got increased risk of hamstrings. And there's excellent work from, um, from, from Timmins, David Opar, Anthony Shield in, in this area. Um, for hamstring injury was reduced by 75% for every 0.5% increase in muscle fascicle length. Now, eccentric, ham, eccentric training results in a rightward shift in the, the torque um, joint angle relationship. Don't focus too much on that but it, it causes elongation of our muscle fascicles. And this happens after eccentric training, not concentric training. So yes, strength is important, but so is muscle fascicle length and eccentrics will lengthen the muscle fascicles, concentrics will shorten them. And you can have big changes in muscle fascicle length over a very short period of time using eccentric training. However, concentric training typically results in a a shortening of muscle fascicles. So maybe there's a difference here in modes of contraction. So eccentrics look good. One of the, the issues in sport is that the, the Nordic hamstring program is quite heavy. So the one proposed by Peterson and, and um, recommends a lot of repetitions, high volume players are not normally accustomed to this type of work. And sometimes they get lots of muscle damage that delayed onset of muscle soreness that results in poor buy-in. So they get soreness, they, they then don't train as well and they, they lose interest in the program. What this program, uh, what this paper from, um, from again, the guys in Australia, Pressland as the first author this time showed that low volume can be equally as effective as high volume um, Nordic hamstring programs. So just doing a little bit can help. So maybe start with some low volume, really try to get the buy-in from the players. You can get just as good adaptations. For me, adaptations in architecture and adaptations in eccentric strength are to do with the intensity of, of it rather than the volume. For volume, it's, we're more concerned with muscle hypertrophy, high intensity architectural adaptations and improvements in strength. So you can do some low volume. You also need to I think consider isometrics. So if eccentrics will cause delayed onset of muscle soreness, um, some, some muscle damage, this can sometimes um, get disinterest from the, from the people involved in your program, impact your buy-in. You can use in longer muscle length training, um, whether that's concentric or isometric, get similar alterations in muscle fascicle length to eccentric training. So fascicle length at longer muscle, so. Uh, strength training at longer muscle lengths results in alterations in muscle fascicle length, similar to, 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 um, to eccentric training. So if you can't get your eccentrics in there, maybe start with some long length muscle, um, muscle strengthening to get those architectural adaptations. I think this is also relevant in hamstring rehab and also um, hamstring strength training after ACL reconstruction. When you can't do your high load eccentrics, maybe start with isometrics at long muscle lengths. Okay, so secondly, I think there's a need to balance the use of, of hip and knee dominant exercises. So hip extension strength is important. Interventions aimed at increasing knee flexor strength do work, but we also need to recognize that the moment arms and internal moments um, at, at the hip are double that of the knee during sprint running. So hip extension moments are very high in sprint running. The hamstring is also a hip extensor working with the adductor magnus and the gluteus maximus. Weakness in hip extension strength is identified as a prospective risk factor for hamstring injuries in sprinters. Generally, if you have a weak glute max or a ductor magnus, your hamstring has to compensate as a hip extensor. It gets overworked and it, it ends up overloading. It's beyond its mechanical limits. 
what we know is different exercises elicit different adaptations. So hamstrings are, are activated heterogeneously during a range of different tasks. Knee dominant exercises target more the semitendinosus and bicep for more of a short head. Hip extension exercises more the semimembranosus and the biceps for more of a long head. So if we're trying to target the biceps femoris, maybe we need some hip extension exercises in there as well. This reiterates the need for a balanced approach. So finally on this one is you need to have a strong focus on high speed or sprint running. So what we know is a lack of sprint running as part of your program increases your risk of hamstring injuries. So there's evidence that irrespective of whether you agree with the acute chronic workload ratio and the debate in the literature, um, elevated workloads beyond what people are used to doing, particularly high speed running and sprint running increases your risk of a hamstring strain. So if you're not used to doing a lot of sprinting, you suddenly have to do a lot more, maybe due to some congested match play, you increase your risk of a hamstring strain. Excellent paper by Shane Maloney showing that regularly achieving peak or near peak running speeds in training is associated with a lower risk of hamstring strains. So making sure you get near your peak running speeds during your training reduces your risk of injuries. Really, really important that you make sure that players are achieving sufficient sprint distance in training or matches. A little bit of theory on sprinting. So sprinting involves high hip and knee moments. So very, very busy table here. But in terms of the hamstrings, what we know is the hamstring forces during running are very, very high, sorry, at maximum speeds. So nearly nine times body weight going through the hamstrings. And there's a big difference between high speed running and sprinting, almost a double in the hamstring force production. High forces, high moments. Um, so sprinting is very demanding for the hamstrings as well as other muscles. Sprinting, a nice paper here, sprinting was also shown to have the highest um, electromyography activity, so muscle active activity than any other exercise. So sprinting has much higher neural activation than the Nordic hamstring. And it has the highest of any recorded hamstring exercise. So if you wanna, we know that intensity is important. We know that activation is important. Sprint running has the highest activation of any exercise. So if we're thinking about a neuromuscular stimulus, uh, stimulus, sprint running should be superior. Sprinting also involves high speeds and low ground contact times. So increase in running speed, we see a reduction in the ground contact time nearly a hundred milliseconds. So that means we have to produce force very rapidly. Hence, it's an excellent stimulus for training rate of force development. And also we have high velocity, so it should train our high velocity strength. So we're getting lots of force, high speed, and very explosive contractions. There is also a performance benefit and an improved buy-in. So sprint running is a key discriminator of performance in football. It's much easier to implement sprinting than it is eccentric training in the gym. Very easy to implement part of the warm-up after training, less resistance to adherence, likely better support from the coach. So what you should do is look to aim to achieve at least 90%, 95% your top speed regularly in training um, to reduce the risk of injuries. Uh, just quite a busy slide, this one. It's just a um, poster that I did at the Isokinetic Conference a couple of years ago. Um, what we know is that training is very good for targeting acceleration, deceleration, cardiovascular stimulus, and it's very good mimic of match play, but it's very poor normally at getting sprint distance. So these are training measures. Generally, sprint distance is very low in training because we have very small areas. So you need to make sure you include top-ups in those people who are not playing regularly. If you play in matches, you'll get lots of sprint distance. If you're only training, you get very little. So you need to make sure that those people not playing regularly get top-ups. Okay, just to summarize, hamstring injuries are on the rise. Uh, they're more complex than you think and require, in my opinion, a holistic approach. You should consider the contextual factors, implement a five-point plan, um, but really consider the specific strengthening approach, balance in the use of eccentrics and isometrics, knee and hip dominant exercises and high speed sprint running as well. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, here's some details if you um, want to get in touch with me.
Thank you, Matt. Um, well, a lot to consider. Um, <laughs> would you mind just stopping the share on your screen? Yep, yeah, sure. Great. So as we did last night, I think the first thing we want to do is just to launch a couple of polls to involve everybody. So there's a simple question on this one, which is, do you believe that the Nordic hamstring exercise program is sufficient to prevent hamstrings in elite football? I'll just launch this and we'll give it about 30 seconds or so. Just whilst you're doing that, just to make you aware that um, we're recording all of the sessions and we'll place them on YouTube um, later in the week. So you'll be able to access and come back to the slides, um, both for today, also um, for yesterday with uh, Francesco's talk on the ACLs. So I think we're just about finished on the voting. I'm just going to end the polling on that one. And just on the results, so 38% yes, 54% no, and 8% waiting for evidence. And then we'll launch the second one so this one is what exercise strategy is superior for preventing hamstring injuries and another 30 seconds on that Okay, just three more seconds and I'll just end the polling on that. And just share those results. So 59% for sprint running and 41% for Nordic hamstring exercise program. So I think we'll start there, Matt. Um, in terms of those poll results, in terms of the, the last one around sprint versus Nordic, thought or commentary yeah a little surprised actually um i don't know whether it would have been the same going in I'd, I'd like to think i've convinced a few people um and that maybe they didn't then arrive with that, that opinion but yeah i mean for me i think sprint running is so vital i think players are you know they have to cope with the demands of running i think what we have is the researchers are potentially a little bit behind in their methodology, um, although that's that's changing with some excellent work from people like J.B. Murren looking at sprint um, sprint mechanics. Um, but, you know, I was guilty of this as a researcher. What we try and do is to simplify our measurement techniques as much as we can. And that allows us to detail um, with less noise. So we're more, you know, the simpler the, 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 the task that we're assessing, the more confidence we can have in, in understanding that. So researchers try to simplify things as much as possible. When we do that, we improve reliability, we lose validity, we lose context. And so I think that's why all the evidence is with the Nordic hamstring program, because it's very simple to assess and it's easier to do those studies. But there is some excellent work coming out over the last few years pointing towards sprint running. So either Maybe I've convinced some people or nice that everyone is keeping up to date with, with the, the current excellent research that is coming out on the topic. And this is not to necessarily name check the Nord board, but obviously the Nord board is very popular within elite sport um, around the world. Um, and in terms of the asymmetries that you might find on that, uh, are asymmetries in your mind significant? And if they are significant then, um, or important, what is the intervention, particularly if you're, if you're reporting a player early in the week with a, a large asymmetry? Oh, tough question. 
Um, I think, one, I do think asymmetries are important um, up to a certain um, a, a certain point. I think within, say, 10%, I don't think it's relevant. Maybe even 15%, I don't think it's relevant. When you have big asymmetries, I think that becomes important. And we know that certain sprinters, some of the best sprinters in the world, have reasonable asymmetries, and they're still able to, to, to sprint at those, those levels. Um, so I think that something like the Nord board or that kind of assessment is, is really good because it allows you to look at those asymmetries. If there's more than a 15, 20% difference, then of course it becomes really relevant and you then need to address that. Um, I think for me would be understanding the reasons why there's a big asymmetry. So what we know is the hamstrings can compensate. So I would, if I saw a big asymmetry, I would think, is it because my hamstring is weak? Or is it because one of them is strong and it's compensating for an imbalance elsewhere? And when we think about the whole system, it might be that you know the hamstring is 10% weaker on the left side, but the glute max is 15% stronger and your adductor magnus is 10% stronger. So when we add all of these imbalances up, then maybe we still have a very good functioning person. Um, but I think large asymmetries are very relevant. Um, so something more than 15% has to be addressed. Um, it might not be just addressing that strength imbalance. It might be a particular compensation as well. The questions are flowing in. So what I'm going to try and do is just pick off a few. Um, Some good ones, <laughs> quite hard ones as well. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> this is trying to link yesterday's talk a little bit to today's talk as well. So um, after an ACL reconstruction with the hamstring tendon, and obviously in different sports, um, in different parts of the world, hamstring or patella um, predominates, but how important is it to include a Nordic hamstring program to the rehab? Um, and I suppose associated with that, is there an inherent weakness in athletes or particularly football players that have had a hamstring graft? Okay, cool. Another hard question. Um, so I guess, firstly, there, the recovery of hamstring strength after an ACL reconstruction using a hamstring graft is sometimes very difficult. And um, it does require selective training. Um, we're actually, as an organization, we're actually doing some research on this at the moment. Hopefully, there'll be a paper out quite shortly, um, quite shortly giving some recommendations on how to recover hamstring strength after ACL reconstruction, because it can be very difficult. Lots of people do return to sport after ACL reconstruction with a deficit. And there's an excellent paper from Caritzis, uh, which Francesco talked about yesterday, showing that for every 10% reduction in hamstring quadricep ratio, there's a tenfold increase in ACL re-injury. So if you fail to recover hamstring strength after ACL reconstruction, go back to sport, your increased risk of ACL and re-injury is really high. The main reason for that is because your ACL is, is your static stabilizer and your hamstring is a dynamic ACL. So if you have weakness of your hamstring, it can't support your already weakened graft. Um, in terms of the Nordic hamstring program, I use that with, and we, um, isokinetic will be using that with, with, um, with the patients after ACL reconstruction as part of a overall holistic approach at strengthening the hamstrings. And some of the things I've discussed here on hamstring prevention, the same strategies should be used um, with hamstring strength recovery after ACL reconstruction. So hip and knee dominant exercises. The main reason for that is because if you've had a semitendinosis graft, you might not necessarily get full regeneration of that tendon. Um, hence, it might not activate appropriately, which means you should compensate with your semimembranosis where possible. Semimembranosis is best trained more using hip extension exercises than the knee flexion exercises. So you might want to compensate with your semimembranosis for the, for the graft. So you should use both hip and knee. So I wouldn't just use the Nordic. I would use that part of a complete program. Lastly, on that point, the Nordic hamstring is a supramaximal eccentric exercise. Hence, it should be part of a progressive hamstring strength program after ACL reconstruction. Did I touch all of those things? Yeah, I think you, I think you covered. Um, I suppose linking to that as well, 
um, a question from Pauline van der Ven was, what do you think about the use of isokinetic strength ratios for detecting players at risk for sustaining an injury? And do you prefer the functional hamstring quad ratio above the conventional ratio? Cool. Um, good question, Pauline. Um, firstly, the evidence available for using the hamstring quadricep ratio to detect players at risk of injury is very poor. Um, Nicole van Dijk has done a excellent paper on this with the Aspatar group showing that the hamstring quad ratio is a poor predictor of future hamstring injuries. They showed that I think the relative risk of a quadricep um, deficit was around 1.4 and eccentric hamstring deficit was again around 1.4. So a 40% increase. But when you put into context the number of players, there's a huge overlap. Uh, so people getting injured versus people not getting injured, there's a huge overlap in strength. It's quite a poor predictor. Um, was there a second part of that? I can't remember. It was about the oh, yeah. functional versus yeah. the conventional. Yeah, so there is some, some earlier evidence from Crossier from the French group showing that it was the functional HQ ratio that was a good predictor of those people getting injured. Um, and actually the conventional um, concentric knee flexion, concentric knee extension was not very good. Lots of evidence showing that concentric, eccentric, concentric hamstring strength is not that relevant for hamstring prevention. It is eccentric strength. However, the Crossier work has really been kind of um, superseded by the work from, um, from Nicole um, in that there's a massive sample size, I think nearly 700 players involved in that, showing that hamstring quad ratio is a weak predictor. However, hamstrings are complex. They involve multiple factors, hence it's probably one factor as part of a, a, a more complete approach. If there's anything I've ever remembered from conversations with you, it's about the hip, so okay. uh, the, <laughs> the role of the hip. So it's a um, great question from Dave Blatz, which is, does anterior pelvic rotation in a hip flexion biased athlete contribute to a greater instance of hamstring injuries? Cool, hard ones are coming in. Um, evidence is not great in terms of there is, I think, one study by Schurman's, um, I think four or five years ago, showing that a role of, of an anterior tilted pelvis and a lateral trunk lean during running was associated with an increased risk of hamstrings. Um, for me, I think the issue here is that the complexity of the hip and what's going on. Um, so why do you have an anterior tilt? Is it because you have tight or weak hip flexors? There is a relationship, there is a evidence showing that rectus femoris length and hip flexor tightness is a risk factor for hamstring strains. Normally, if you have tight hip flexors, you see an anterior tilted pelvis. Um, there is evidence that if your hip flexors are tight, maybe they are overactive, maybe they are compensating for poor pelvic stabilizers, hence your core is overall not sufficiently strong. If, if that happens, they can sometimes inhibit your glute max. It's very wishy-washy research, but the glute max then becomes a bit inhibited, the hamstring compensates. Um, so if you have an anterior tilted pelvis, maybe you've got a weak glute max, which is a posterior tilted and um, posterior tilt muscle as well. So it's a whole host of imbalances that can happen. Um, but the issue is backing that up really with evidence. There's some, there's some sketchy research sort of flying all over the place um, that you have to sort of draw together. But for me, I would say it does play a role. Again, part of a more complex picture. Um. For our international listeners, wishy-washy. <laughs> Sorry. <sketchy. laughs> our low-grade evidence. So, um, Apologies. Uh, and I guess and this is congratulations to Nikos, who's submitted five questions. So I feel like we have to we have to give him one. So, mm -hmm. um, question really about um, his first question is about sprinters and why sprinters. You might want to go back to that point about why sprinters seem to be um, at high risk. And then associated, I suppose, with that is the role of fatigue. Cool. Um, 
thanks Nikos. Um, so firstly, sprinters, well, we injure our hamstring during sprinting. Um, there's excellent work from Shumanov and the Dawn paper as well, um, showing that with increased running speed, that the hamstrings end up going under more and more load. So at very, very high speeds, the hamstrings are highly activated under lots of load. So if you're sprinting at really, really high speeds, then of course you're gonna be using your hamstrings quite a lot. And actually it's when you start to hit 90, 95, 100% of your maximum speed that you put the hamstrings under incredible tension, which is probably why the hamstrings get injured during competition because that's when these athletes are really testing themselves at their maximum speeds. Um, also with sprinters, you know, they're, they're, they're like any athlete, they're susceptible to getting injured. They run in a straight line. Um, they're unlikely to tear their ACL. They have no contact. They have no, so some of the things Francesco was saying yesterday, they have no real um, distraction. Hence, they're running in a straight line. They're more likely to pick up a doctor longus hamstring um, injuries. So you're going to see that a lot in them. Um, and the role of fatigue, um, probably a bit more complex, but I would say what happens with, so again, Shumanov's work showing that the negative energy that's produced and accepted by the hamstrings in sprinting is quite high. Um, those eccentric contractions cause damage to the, to the hamstring, some little micro tears, so the more sprints you do, the more fatigue you're gonna get. Um, some nice work showing that there's about a 20% reduction in hamstring strength at the end of match play versus at the start. So at the end of match play, your, your hamstring is 20% weaker than when you began the game. Nice work from Small, Patel and Grigatel on that. And so I think the role of fatigue is a bit more complex. I think what happens is congested match play, players do lots of high speed running, the hamstring gets 20% weaker at the end of the first match. They don't have time for recovery before the second game. They enter the next match 10% weaker than they were in the first game. You then have another 20% strength loss. You then enter the third game, maybe even 20% weaker than the first. And then you have that almost like downward spiral of strength. And it gets to a point where the mechanical capacity of the muscle is, is too low. And suddenly now these, these exercises pose a problem. Um, finally, on that, the role of kind of um, aerobic fitness and acute fatigue. We know that acute fatigue can impact sort of neuromuscular control, control of your pelvis, impact your sprint mechanics, then puts more strain on the hamstrings as well. Just time for two quick ones. So um, this is from Dubai from um, Paddy Farhart. Um, have you thought, and it could be a yes or a no, have you thought about implementing an RCT? comparing Nordics alone versus a combination of Nordics plus single leg hip extension plus deadlifts in reducing incidence of hamstring injuries? Um, I haven't, <laughs> mostly just because um, I'm not in a position to, I don't really have too much interest in, in producing lots of um, evidence myself i'm focusing much more on translation of evidence into practice i think there is some work from the australians looking at um the sort of nordic versus hip dominant exercises um, i'd expect the australian group to really they are the ones producing the original research that i'm either you know trying to use or in some cases criticizing but they're the ones really producing the fantastic research um, as practitioners or translational researchers, we focus on yeah, translating that into practice, but we are very dependent on these highly skilled researchers to give us that, that data. Um, there's a fantastic paper underway from JB Moran's group looking at those multifactorial approaches um, that will, so now that these guys are really pushing the boundaries of the research. And I think that will give us lots of interesting information. And last, um... And as much as you talk to me about hips, I talk to you about communication. <laughs> and a little, I suppose, segue into tomorrow evening's talk, the role of communication relative to preventing hamstring injuries. Yeah, I mean, I think 
I'm looking forward to listening to you tomorrow because I think communication is just fundamental in, in, in everything we do. If, and I'd say this to any students listening, it's, it's not just what you know, it's how you communicate that information to the people you work with, work for, the athletes you represent. And I think anyone with, with reasonable experience will, will say that when they were young, they probably used lots of technical terms. The more experience they got, the simpler their messages got. It's because, you know, we need to be communicating in very simple terms. And we know that the coaches influence injury risk. They're the ones really that have overall control and respect within a club. So SNC coaches, sports scientists are going to have less respect within a club environment. And they're still vitally important, but players will not respect them to the same degree they do their managers. So you need support from your medical, um, your medical team needs support from your coach. In order to get support from your coach, you can't blind them with science. You need to develop your relationship with them. They need to trust you and need to trust your messaging so that they can back it and give you support. Any SNC coach working in an elite environment without the support of the people around them is not going to achieve what they want. So communication is fundamental and probably more important than technical knowledge. So skills are more important than technical knowledge in, in elite sports. So yeah, looking forward to your talk tomorrow on that. Great, I think we're gonna end there. So Matt, thank you again, um, a great contribution. And again, to our attendees, it's just wonderful to have you all with us. Um, we look forward to the opportunity of being physically together sometime next year. Um, and if you have the time tomorrow, um, I'll be speaking from 6 p.m. London time and Amy Arundel will be running the um, question and answer session with me. As, as I said before, the slides and the video will be up online probably on Wednesday this week from all three of the sessions. And if you've got any questions, either come back to myself or direct to Matt and uh, we'll be happy to help. So enjoy the rest of your Sundays maybe even Mondays for those that are on the other side of the world and uh, look forward to chatting to you soon. Thank you.